Okay, they, uh, they, will, uh, they will allow you now. So just uh, a few words for the, op uh, for the opening. So we are opening our fourth uh, year conference. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, uh, to be the chair of this uh, conference, and uh, uh, we try to maintain the same quality as uh, we had the previous years. So uh, we are skeptics, uh, not mistaken, only. 65% uh, of the papers that were uh, submitted uh, to the conference, conference to ensure the uh, high quality of all the materials uh, that will be pre uh, presented uh, today. Uh, uh, so we, uh, we are going to continue developing our conference, but probably we will change a little bit the format uh, for the next year. So, and uh, we will inform uh, you a little bit later how it will be and uh, uh, what will uh, change. So uh, we will have a one day event today. We have uh, uh, 21 uh, papers to be presented and uh, one talk that will be given uh, like a pl uh, plenary talk. I think, I, I hope that everyone will enjoy uh, this day and uh, uh, you will get uh, new interesting ideas uh, to be able to communicate with other people. Uh, so, and uh, the keynote today will be delivered by the uh, Professor uh, Dmitry Tsiukov from SCOLTEP, who will talk about uh, deep learning uh, for so autonomous uh, driver. Uh, so, Dmitry, you start. So, hope you, you have access. Yes, you do. Yeah, can you see my slides? Is it okay? Uh, can you hear me? See the team, uh, the teams just uh, joining the uh, page. Probably not the slide, but the uh, mm -hmm. uh, browser. One second. How about now? Can you see? Let's see, but not full screen. Now, full screen mode? Yes, it's fine now. Okay. okay. Yeah, um, thank you for inviting me uh, for a uh, well organized conference. Uh, and uh, today I will be talking about the deep learning for mobile robots and self driving cars. So, in general, um, so this topic is uh, currently is widely uh, developed, but also lots of uh, new technologies that are upcoming and can give opportunity for new application and for a new level of implementation of mobile robots and self-driving car in human society. So as to the uh, market overview, it's considered that according to the Boston Consulting Group, uh, the number of, uh, uh, so to two, uh, 2030, uh, the uh, uh, market of robots, jo joint market of robots, will reach from $160 billion to $260 billion. And uh, the uh, service robots will um, overperform in the number for deployment the uh, industrial ro robotics. So in general, service robots is not only the mobile robotics, for sure, uh, indoor robotics, but also it's uh, medical robotics and so on. But in general, most of the hugest part of the service robotics is IMR, so it's autonomous mobile robots. So as to the recent uh, advances in self-driving cars, so in general, both of the technology, indoor and outdoor, they're using the SLAM simultaneous localization mapping, I'm talking about it a little bit later. But the most recent uh, technologies that uh, were presented is by a company, Baidu, a Chinese company, which uh, presented uh, the self-driving car, Apollo, so it's facilitated, the typical car is facilitated with many sensors to provide the safety of navigation and so-called sensor fusion because each sensor works very well with specific distance. So LiDAR works with a large distance as a rider as well. And also cameras uh, provide uh, the information, visual information in good 
lighting condition. So in general, the uh, main achievements of the car is all full integration of the sensors inside of this car, and also they're using uh, Apollo platform that they developed by Baidu. So this platform um, uh, helps to deploy and develop. Uh, it's it's like basically like ROS for cars. Uh, so, in the cost uh, of this car is just $37,000 uh, that can be accessed, and it's expected that thousands of these cars will appear uh, next year. So, in another uh, case, it's uh, Cruise by General Motors, and it's uh, the first com company which got the permit to uh, charge for self driving cars in San Francisco, and this uh, service is uh, operating. Uh, and actually, it's an interesting story about how the self-driving car started. It's, first, it was a DARPA challenge uh, in the United States since 2004. And actually, many people who participated from MIT, it's the main universities in the United States, MIT, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, uh, most of the people who participated in this event, they became or founder, co-founders, or uh, developers, main de chief developers of the self-driving cars, for example. Chris, uh, one of the CTO, is the graduate of MIT. Uh, so let's consider a little bit insight of uh, what is odometry, what is localization, and what is uh, uh, mapping, and why uh, we need uh, simultaneous localization and mapping. So first of all, we need to understand where the robot is uh, located. Uh, one of the uh, most basic uh, part and widely used in, in robotics is odometry. So odometry basically is accounting and calculations the position of the wheeled robot. In our case, it's wheeled robot. It can be for for sure in collaborative robot using the encoder. Uh, so in this case, we have the wheel odometry. Uh, however, not only the encoder can be used to calculate the position of the robot. So if you know how how many counts, so we, we can understand how long the wheel moves, right? So we also can use the visual odometry. Basically, uh, it's, we can can calculate the position of the of the uh, robot or the um, car just using the camera. Uh, it can be laser odometer, so to get the distance to the object. And uh, for sure, one of the widely used uh, technologies is EMU. The problem with EMU is uh, has uh, some drift, but in general, EMU is not used uh, uh, independently. It's typically used with GNSS. Uh, uh, global positioning system, or for example, with uh, visual natural odometry. However, the main problem of, of the odometry, just using the odometry, is the linear increase of error. So we have, uh, <clears throat> so uh, when we update the position of the robot, this error is accumulated uh, and uh, through the measurement, and then at the end we can achieve, for example, loop closure. Uh, so it's used for first approximation of SLAM and part of optimization objective of SLAM. However, in general, the odometry uh, just, for example, built odometry used together with uh, the LiDAR and uh, cameras all together. So second uh, problem that exists, and if you imagine how you navigate in the city, first of all, you have a map. If you know the environment, right, if you know where to go, so you have a map in your mind. And then basically you update your map on each step, right? So you localize yourself inside of this map and then update to reach the goal. So same happens. Uh, so in general, in this case, you have pre-recorded map and most of, uh, of the autonomous cars and, and uh, mobile robots use the pre-recorded map. So the position itself uh, with, with already known environment. Right. Uh, however, uh, environment can change, can be changed, it can be dynamic and human can work or, for example, by bicycle. IP are on the path, so the, for, for this case, we need to detect them and, uh, and avoid the collision. So, so for the task for the localization is to find the robot position by using measurement and positions of known landmarks. So known landmarks can be buildings, uh, it can be, for example, the traffic light or the border of the road, uh, whatever. And uh, for sure, uh, we also uh, have to update this information right on each step. So for the mapping of the system, uh, so we need to construct a map based on the known robot trajectory and measurement. 
and uh, we use the map basically to provide the path planning. So, for example, when you get with your mobile phone, you you already have the route and just follow it. But in general, this software provides you the path planning, right? So most optimal path to reach the goal. And for sure, the second one is collision avoidance. And for example, when you have the mobile phone, you don't. You, what is your task is to provide collision avoidance, right? Because it's, uh, the, the system doesn't know where the pedestrians are there. But in, in the case of robot, uh, this information should be obtained and provided um, and generated the path to, to avoid the collision. What the uh, typical uh, problems for SLAM technologies? So SLAM is simultaneous localization and mapping. First of all, it's dynamic environment, so everything is changing. Uh, and we can record once and then move again. So um, second is heterogeneous sensors. So we, we need to make the sensor fusion and all of them have different parameters from the precision distance of, and recognition technique for recognition of object or detection of the distance, right? So it's a LiDAR. Uh, laser sensor which are which is good to detect in the distance cameras to detect the visual uh, information odometer and initial measurement units the third uh, problem is the sensor noise and miscalibration so in general each time not each time but in general you need to calibrate all of your sensors including uh, lidars cameras odometer and so on so uh, also long-term robustness require, requirements because we travel for long distances for thousands of kilometers in case of the self-driving cars and computational memory constraints because in general we have the very <clears throat> uh, narrow place to position the uh, high performance computers so what we have is limited uh, hardware resources so therefore we need to uh, optimize the computational uh, uh, power uh, and uh, for sure the memory storage. Uh, so uh, for the SLAM problem, we need to find the trajectory and landmarks positions by using measurements and endometry. So measurements, it means that using these are heterogeneous sensors. So the main difference between SLAM and endometry is the loop closure. So what is the loop closure? So in general, with endometry, we can understand where we already visited this position or this location or not. So in the case of uh, SLAM, we can recognize which some features uh, on the uh, image that we already visited this place, update the information and provide much more precision of navigation in the environment. So here you can see the typical uh, uh, typical neural, net, net, neural networks which are used in uh, robotics and in other applications. So it's basically convolutional recurrent neural network, now the encoder neural network. So what are advantages of deep learning? First of all, it uh, provides the adaptation to different lighting conditions. So it's uh, decreased memory by using compression information. It also can uh, provide high level semantic understanding and increase uh, at the end, increase uh, the accuracy and robustness. And in general, deep learning, we uh, apply for uh, deep depth prediction. For example, we have just a visual camera and one of the main trends is to move from LiDAR, which is very expensive technology, uh, to the camera. Uh, navigation, so for example, visual odometry, and uh, also to perceive with just single camera the depth. So one of the solutions is to use, to use deep neural network. So also deep visual odometry, uh, object detection, one of the key technology, visual place recognition, semantic segmentation, uh, key point detection and description. <clears throat> Um, okay, so next, what are the recent trends in uh, in uh, SLAM technologies? And actually, this area is uh, uh, very highly progressive, and each uh, each big conference like uh, uh, yeah, ICRA or uh, uh, IRAS is presents a new technology in this field. But in general, up up until now, the golden standard is Orb SLAM 3 by University of Zaragoza. In general, it's, it's uh, uh, achieves the most robust uh, and precise, accurate um, data uh, for the navigation of the robots and open winds. But also, the modern trends uh, appeared recently. So in general, these trends include deep learning in SLAM front end. So for example, uh, it's uh, uh, 
used uh, unsupervised visual geometry and depth prediction, key point detection and description, hierarchical localization, and so on. So for, for just to list few of the most recent technology in uh, the SLAM, it's a cube SLAM, DIG SLAM, PL SLAM, and Walder SLAM. So for uh, deep learning in front end, so front end is one of the application of deep learning front end. Uh, to uh, improve the quality of general the SLAM technology. So hierarchical localization and also unsupervised visual autometry and depth prediction. So in general, if we consider the traditional SLAM technology, they are uh, basically the uh, filter-based SLAM, and they're using the filters, uh, for example, SLAM, to predict the position of the robot. Why do we need to predict the position? Because again, we have the sensor fusion. Uh, data are scattered. Uh, for example, it's uh, for GPS uh, signal or for LiDAR. It also has uh, rank of precision. For example, the Velodyne has plus minus two centimeters for 100 uh, meter. Uh, and also, uh, so for this, we need uh, definitely to, to, to make some filtering technique. Um, and particle filters. So this general common and particle filter are used for, for filter-based technology. Second uh, is the graph-based. So graph-based, uh, we need to optimize the graph. And uh, for, in this is second class of uh, the SLAM technology. So as to as for the two most recent, one of the most recent, one is 2020 Nike technology. So this deep SLAM is uh, a robust and efficient uh, visual SLAM algorithm these deep features. Uh, so basically the uh, benefits of this algorithm is uh, uh, DNN-based deep neural network uh, message for place recognition uh, and feature detection. Uh, however, the, uh, it's not validated well and only use the Kitty dataset. In general, to validate the SLAM, uh, there needs to be a stack of dataset to prove this, that quality. And another one is to detect the object and it's called, called object SLAM and name of the technology is Kupi Slam. The uh, positive feature, so basically it can recognize the objects such as chair uh, in, in the room and in outside, outdoor environment. And basically it provides that it's uh, uh, markers on the road of the uh, robot. So it, it's in, uh, used DNN-based method for object detection and provides a high quality of object detection. And also the validation is limited only for one data set. The Kitty data set was generated, as I remember, Karlsruhe University. Uh, but in general, it's it's pretty old data set, but up until now it's most widely used. But definitely Oxford data set uh, and other one, uh, the Harvard data set, they, they basically becomes also popular for testing the uh, algorithm. So another one is visual localization. So what kind of technology currently, what kind of, uh, uh, deep learning technology are used to detect, uh, to, to understand where the robot is actually, or car is actually located. So first one is image-based. So we, we image-based, uh, uh, basic idea is we check the image and compare some uh, features that are stored in data set. So it has the good scalability and stability of changing uh, condition, but it has a low localization accuracy. The second one is structure-based. So we understand not just image descriptors, uh, but also, but first of all, uh, we uh, calculate the structure, of, first of all, 3D structure uh, on the image, and then uh, understand basically uh, where the robot location comparing these, these structure parameters or from from the image we obtain from the camera and final one is uh, hierarchical localization it uh, includes image based uh, visual localization structure based basically it has a good scalability and uh, first of all high localization accuracy and uh, fast operation time however there is a big model size and big model size one of the key issue of current slam technology so now i'd like Talk is overview of uh, the recent technology which appeared in uh, in conference, main conference in robotics. Uh, but now I would like to talk about the technology that we have developed in our laboratory, and it's called the uh, GAN-based image preprocessing for robust multi-vessel autonomous vehicle localization. So this, in general, the main idea of our work 
is to achieve the uh, safety of navigation and robustness of navigation in a dark environment. This is one of the key issues up until now. This paper was presented recently in conference uh, vehicle technology uh, um, by the students of the laboratory. So our motivation is that, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, global uh, market is uh, growing a lot, and uh, lots of number of companies, um, uh, lots of companies appeared recently. Uh, 2019 year was called years of uh, uh, delivery robots. So almost each uh, you know, retail company, e-commerce company, uh, huge uh, such as, uh, um, for example, the Amazon and FedEx, uh, develop their own solution. Uh, but in general, the fact is that ma uh, market will reach uh, two hundred twenty billion dollars in the pos positive, uh, uh, positive uh, future for for this robotic. For sure, it can be less, but the current state of development can provide us a promising data. Uh, and for robust navigation, the simultaneous localization mapping problem arises. So again, so simultaneous means that we need to update the position and at the same time to update the map uh, for each state for each step of iteration each step of motion of the robot uh, so the difficulty uh, is that uh, we need to navigate in different weather and lighting conditions so if we for example calibrate camera and did experiment for the good lighting condition it absolutely doesn't mean that it will work in winter condition or for example in dark environment uh, especially when it comes that we are navigating only using the camera, uh, because uh, again, it's, uh, if for lidar it's not much different what kind of uh, uh, lighting condition exists, right? For for example, for navigation by camera, uh, the lighting conditions are very crucial. So here are the several uh, examples. So the leading company right now on the delivery robot is Starship Company. Basically, it's originally from Estonia, but they have the head office in the United States. There are also uh, some companies working on the cleaning robot and uh, Russian companies, uh, the leader in this technology is the Yandex uh, delivery, uh, which manufactures the delivery robots and, and doing the experiments. So what is the main problem that we would like to solve in our research is that uh, uh, in real environment, we have the wide range of luminosity from a com uh, completely dark environment to the bright condition. Actually, one of the uh, accidents which occurred uh, with uh, Tesla when they when they, that time they used the mobile eye technology, it's an Israeli company which was bought by uh, Intel for several uh, billion dollars. So that's basically just single camera which uh, can detect the distance to the object. But uh, in the case of the bright condition, uh, it failed and uh, it can fail and basically one of the accidents occurs uh, because of the of the uh, bright conditions of environment so and uh, same for the dark condition so the uh, uber accidents the most famous one uh, in 2018 uh, where the uh, uh, woman was killed by the car and it, it happened in dark condition uh, and in general, they claim that, uh, that uh, the problem was in the algorithm of the car navigation, but definitely the dark condition will increase considerably the risk of mixed detection, uh, especially by the cameras. So as the uh, uh, recent technologies is in this area, uh, it's a visual natural slam. So basically visual natural means that we combine for, for the positioning and, and mapping of uh, mobile robot, we can uh, combine visual data and inertial data from EMU sensor. Uh, and uh, for example, when we have the low uh, low quality image, we can rely on EMU. In opposite way, we will rely on visual sense, uh, visual um, data. So in basically, it's the main uh, technology right now in the uh, SLAM, it's ORF SLAM 3, which basically for includes the visual, visual, natural, and multi-map slam. So the second one is um, the technology peak lock for robust uh, localization. The positive uh, feature is that it, it ignores uh, short-term entities, 
um, which can appear, for example, leaf of uh, the tree, right, appear on the image, but it has a poor localization, is seen with uh, vegetation and no mapping provided. So, in uh, um, technology for um, uh, navigation in adverse uh, conditions, uh, which was proposed uh, for adversarial training uh, in 2018. Um, it has the gun again reprocessing to improve the localization. However, there is no any mapping in this environment, so uh, it's only for localization. And uh, uh, it also provides only untrusted localization. So in general, there was no uh, no any. Uh, confident experiments that prove that it can work also with mapping and when we don't know uh, some we don't we can change judge how would we did the localization and another last one is for place recognition across the seasons uh, so basically to distinguish whether it's a winter environment summer environment and so on so this paper also pretty recent and using again pre-processing so in general to uh, to explain what is the uh, and why we apply the GAN technology, it's one of the most recent, more or less recent uh, technology in deep uh, learning. So GAN, uh, GAN means the generative adversarial network, and it, it basically includes the two units. One is uh, which generate the uh, um, target uh, output, and second uh, unit is a kind of classifier or discriminator. So basically, it must recognize the true information uh, from the image which, which uh, provides the generator. So basically, the first one is try to cheat in the second uh, unit, and second must to not be cheated. So basically, it must understand the true information from this. And uh, in general, this technology is in the a class of unsupervised learning. So in general, one of the main application of the GAN technology is, for example, generation, generating the lifelike uh, images, uh, avatars, uh, talking heads, and so on. So with lots of application. But in our specific uh, um, uh, target and goal, uh, we are using the uh, SLAM, uh, we are using the technology of, of GAN to uh, pre-process the data for uh, visual localization mapping. So our no novelty is uh, to apply the GAN assistant visual SLAM approach, which we uh, called dark SLAM because it's working in dark environment, uh, which it will work in extremely dark condition. So in general, we are using uh, is input uh, um, images, data set, which we collected in dark environment. Then we trained uh, GAN generated network and uh, obtain the images that then we are feeding with uh, simultaneous localization and mapping algorithm, which in our case we're using the uh, more robust one, ORP SLAM 3. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, so our uh, goal is to improve the mobile robot localization performance in extremely dark environment. So it also can, can be not only mobile robot, but also for sure self driving cars. And our objective is to study the performance of modern uh, visual SLAM algorithm in different light condition to propose the image enhancement method. So in this case, we propose the uh, GAN technology and embed it in visual SLAM pipeline and validate the performance of uh, proposed algorithm. So in general, as a platform uh, for experiments, we use the robot which uh, was developed in my laboratory, we called it uh, Hermes bot, and it has uh, six wheels. So six wheels is clear. So to avoid the uh, the um, to climb, basically, right, with, with no uh, uh, staking on on the uh, pavement. Uh, so it includes uh, a bunch of sensors. Uh, so uh, basically, the lidar, but lidar we are using typically for the uh, only for uh, ground truth data. In general, our idea is to provide the navigation of this ro uh, robot only using the visual data. So basically, it has the array of uh, cameras around this robot, six uh, rolling shutter chip cameras, uh, which uh, uh, get the visual information. We also have uh, the Intel Real Sense depth sensors in front of the robot, as well as the fish eye camera, Intel Real Sense T265. Uh, 
And uh, definitely we, for odometer, for uh, getting information from the uh, wheel rotation, uh, we use, use the model, model encoder and everything is processed on NVIDIA Jetson. Uh, so basically uh, what we are doing, we collected the data set of images that uh, we uh, use the proposed technology to provide, uh, to, to kind of enhance, right, enhance the, the image, so to feed them uh, for the ORP extractor. So the ORP feature extractor uh, uh, moves this information to ORP slam 3 and at the end we get the um, estimated trajectory and the map for the uh, mobile robot. Uh, so for the, uh, for the um, uh, low light image enhancement we applied the uh, enlightening uh, GAN technology. So here you can see the overview of the dark slam uh, algorithm. So again, we uh, get the images from the camera. Uh, then we build the uh, attention map, uh, feed this, this uh, data to the proposed uh, GAN generator, and then obtain the enhanced image that can be processed uh, uh, as an ordinary image by the um, by the SLAM technology. So what is about data set? Again, this, uh, there is no available data set in dark environment, so therefore we collect it. So we collected our unique data set in an extremely dark environment in our uh, campus. Uh, as in general, we consider the indoor navigation of the robot. So and obtained uh, 14 sequences in varying lighting conditions. So first one is shaded from five to Nine uh, looks uh, lux and uh, semi dark from three to five and dark from two from zero to two. And we use the global shutter camera, it's a professional camera by Imagine Source, uh, to record image data. So with resolution of uh, 640 by 480 pixels, uh, 20 frames per second, and trajectory length was uh, 15 meters. So uh, also, we did it in uh, the room with uh, motion capturing system Viken, which pro provides sub-millimeter accuracy, and therefore, basically, we had this ground truth. Uh, um, so, based on this, we can do the validate the experiment, and so on. So, here you can see uh, three images. Probably on your screen, they all dark, but first is the shaded uh, sequence sample. Uh, the middle one is semi-dark, and the last is dark when uh, almost nothing can be seen by the even human eye. So uh, for the first experiment, uh, we uh, compared our proposed preprocessing model um, for the ORP feature extraction with uh, traditional uh, approaches for, uh, for the image processing. So first image, uh, you can see uh, this without uh, processing data, uh, detection of the sun features. Uh, second is uh, with our proposed me method. Uh, third is histogram equalization. Last is gamma correction. So in general, we would like to compare how many uh, key features we can detect uh, using the different approaches. And from this graph, experimental result, you can see the uh, basically the proposed uh, processing is the orange one, is our approach. And histogram equalization is uh, the green one. So basically, the highest and the second highest number of feature matches uh, which we obtained on images uh, were with histogram equalization and with our approach. So it's 261 and 200 features were matched. So the high number of features matched is for histogram equalization because of the image noisiness. So basically, this is a, uh, one of the drawbacks. So the lowest number of features match is detected uh, on the original dark images as is expected. On average, only 81 features are matched. So again, so based on the darkness, uh, dark environment, so the more dark environment, the less features we can obtain. So second, uh, we uh, did the um, experiment for the uh, SLAM performance with our, again, uh, preprocessing module. So uh, our goal was to validate the performance of, of our proposed approach. And as a methodology, we, we uh, applied for SLAM itself, for or SLAM 3, uh, with classic processing. Uh, and we measured the absolute trajectory error 
and uh, correctness rate. So basically, it's ATE, the less ATE, the better. And correctness rate uh, can be calculated from this form. So on this graph, you can see the different trajectories, right? Different trajectories calculated. So uh, basically, this trajectory ground truth is uh, this uh, light blue color, right? So ground truth, which was calculated with uh, motion capturing system Lycan with submillimeter accuracy. Uh, so uh, ORP SLAM 3 is the pink one with uh, gamma correction. You see how big error appears, basically the high absolute trajectory error. And uh, uh, um, ORP SLAM 3 itself is the green one, right? So it it's, uh, has uh, pretty large mistakes for dark images, right? And uh, basically, this histogramic equalization is also generates a quite good quality signal. Uh, so, at the end, uh, as a result of the experiment, um, we can conclude so that if you compare the uh, position of the robot in different uh, dark conditions, so shaded, semi dark, and dark, our uh, proposed technology with GAN pre processing generate the robust navigation in shaded environments, semi-dark environment. Basically, CR uh, uh, correctness rate is, we achieve 84%, 73%, and even we partially can work in completely dark environment, which is not accessible for the ORP SLAM 3, which can more or less work in just shaded environment, and other ORP SLAM preprocessing like gamma correction and histogram equalization. So in general, uh, in general, the proposed approach significantly improves the uh, uh, CR and it is increased by 43%, 60%, and 25% comparing to original ORP SLAM technology. Uh, and AT uh, um, uh, error of uh, trajectory uh, was uh, pretty small, 5.6 centimeter. Uh, 13 centimeters, 17 centimeters uh, with for three environments for, for shaded, semi dark, and dark environment on the 15 meter trajectory. So, and therefore, uh, finally, our method outperforms both gamma correction and histogram equalization in terms of the two metrics here and AT. So, as a conclusion, uh, in overall simultaneous localization and mapping algorithm, dark slam capable of working in extremely dark condition uh, was proposed. Um, so the number of orb uh, feature matches extracted from dark images increased in 2.5 times compared compared to the not process images, and uh, uh, dark slam outperforms golden standard or slam three algorithm in terms of average correctness rate and accuracy by 42.8 percent and 2.3 times in dark condition respectively. Uh, so for the future work, uh, we are considering to study the generalization of preprocessing modules to bright light conditions. So we concentrate it only on dark environment. We can um, scale it up for the bright light condition because in bright it's uh, opposite uh, situation and speed up the network in preprocessing module. So now I would like to talk a little bit about the project on autonomous vehicles that we are doing in our laboratory. And basically this um, uh, deep neural network we applied in each of them. Uh, so first of all, I would like to talk about the robot uh, we have developed um, for the uh, Decathlon uh, company. It is robot uh completely developed in uh, my laboratory uh, starting from electronics uh, sensor fusion uh, except of the of the shell so shell was developed by perfido for lab i mean this, this plastic case but all mechanics were designed uh, by my uh, phd master student so as to specification it has a bunch of rgbd camera so rgbd camera needed for detection of the human for so what is the task of this robot the task of this robot is to automate the inventory so inventory is one of the key challenges for uh, the uh, shops for example such huge large store in decathlon which is general it's not just store it's also the warehouse itself right and um, uh, inside of this tower of this robot, there are four, um, you know, four antenna, RFID antenna. And basically, the uh, key strategy of Decathlon is uh, completely move 
to so each of the goods on the shelf must be provided with RFID marker. In January, they try to achieve 100% of all goods. Uh, now they they almost close to this number. So therefore, we need to read this data automatically. Currently, it's done by manually. So the humans go through the shops uh, once per day. Typically, with uh, the object look like rocket, it's, uh, in which include the, uh, some small antenna, and the read. Um, all the information inside of the warehouses, uh, in, inside of the store warehouses, uh, selectively. So they don't provide the whole information, just general information, most critical points. And uh, one of the big problem is the percentage of mistakes, uh, which, um, uh, which uh, almost 35%, uh, and full inventory requires 60 hours. So with our autonomous robots, we achieved the four hours of full inventory uh, of uh, the Decathlon uh, store and achieved just 12% of mistakes. But most recent, uh, uh, most recent robot achieved much less uh, percentage of mistakes at the end. So it includes a uh, range of sensors. It's a big uh, uh, technology in terms of sensor fusion. It uses the RGBD camera. Um, you see it on the top. Right, so the vision range is in front of the robot to detect the human because it's it's a very challenging environment. There are lots of children running around, the the uh, adults and so on, and we need to provide absolute safety of navigation inside of this dynamic environment. Uh, it, it's use the front Hakuyo lidar. It's a, a Japanese lidar uh, which can detect the distance up to 10 meters in radius. RP lidar is a cheaper technology from. A Chinese lighter from the uh, back uh, side to detect some human which can uh, come close to this robot. Ultrasonic sensors are surrounding the robot to detect the close distance precisely. Uh, six, uh, actually six RFID antennas and two RFID readers. Uh, so, uh, and this robot uh, completely excludes the human from the task, so it provides a fully auto autonomous. Uh, Autonomous uh, scanning of RFID uh, codes allows the full inventory just in eight hours for one store of the Catalan. Uh, considerably decreases number of mistakes and automatically avoids obstacle. Here on this image, you see the SLAM technology inside of the inside of the uh, store. So here, basically, you can see the shelves, right, and the lines uh, shows the trajectory of the robot, uh, which generate autonomously no human uh, behind this robot. Um, okay, let's. Yeah, I will. Let's watch the video how it operates. So basically, it can read uh, up to one meter data from RFID tags, which I touched in the photo. One of the interesting features of this technology is that we basically can make statistics of food store during the day and provide the optimal positioning of the food. What we can do is uh, this detection at least in the morning and uh, evening time and in the day statistics. One of the main challenges was to detect the students this neural network. And basically, for this, we use the uh, RGBD camera so to detect not only the uh, visual parameters, but also depth information. And here, uh, deep learning was used for detection of the human. It was in one year we did the experiment with the robot in the small store. There were, were no competing with the model. So, before we started with the case, we 
uh, in some cases, when uh, it requires the collision avoidance, it also generates the phase uh, loss. Basically, a creator needs only just to set up the uh, task to make selecting scanning. Also, you see the color. Yeah, here's a case when the, when it's typical for this case of children can run, can climb, can throw, can throw with robot, and so on. And it's really a change in environment. Uh, because it must be a the safety for people. So another project I would like to talk about is uh, Project Bear Vision, which was done during actually almost uh, seven years of research in my laboratory by a master and PhD student in Juan Kalinov. Who is currently the head of uh, the uh, Yandex uh, uh, Logistics Robotics Department, and uh, he is currently run more than 20 people. Half of them are graduate of my laboratory, and uh, uh, he developed a very interesting technology for the automation of uh, inventory in, in warehouses, not in the shops, but in warehouses. And the main challenge is the height of typical warehouses up to 12 meters. So therefore, current technology that we leave to the human by the uh, by the machine to the height, and it's uh, manually scanned by the laser scan. So therefore, again, the problem is the same, lots of uh, human factors. It's also not safe for human, and it takes a lot of time. Uh, so therefore, our solution was to apply the uh, heterogeneous robotic team, it's in general, the a Mars rover, uh, current Mars rover, Mars 2020 is also heterogeneous team of two robots, the flying one and the mobile one. And uh, the positive feature is, first of all, we take advantage of the drone to fly up to the uh, height of 12 meters. And the second, we do all the processing information on the board of the mobile robot. Plus, mobile robots generate the map of the environment and provide the full SLAM stack. And basically, uh, how we detect the position of the drone with uh, AR markers and camera installed on the mobile robots. So we also propose very interesting technology. You can uh, check uh, the uh, publication, several publication uh, about this starting from BTC 2019 uh, for localization of the drone. And also to use a CNN, convolutional neural network for detection. The, uh, barcodes because in general if we consider the store so rfid is a solution because it can be easily uh, read it, uh, read by the sensor in the case of the warehouses they don't like to to move to the rfid for one reason it's too expensive each rfid cost uh, several rubles and um, in general they use a traditional technology barcode so in this case the drone has a uh, global shutter camera and uh, cnn to detect the uh, precisely the uh, barcode, and we did several. The recent technology that was developed by Yandex was actually developed by team of Marine, and instead of using the drone, they used the technology of rays and scan. Definitely is a good idea behind all this is the first of all the robustness of that such technologies. We don't rely on the flight time of the drone. So one of the challenges we hit in we try to solve is the time flight of the drone. So we need to recharge it. So when we have the frame with the set of cameras and all module as was shown before, SLAM was done on the mobile platform. So in this case, we uh, provide the long configuration without any any um, Delays. So another uh, uh, research we are working is again is uh, uh, we are working on this technology in dark environment and bad weather condition for several years, and uh, we developed uh, five years ago the Oscar research platform for self-driving cars, 
uh, basically we did the setup of uh, you see the setup of Madi team together with Coltec, which we participated in Winter City 2019, and we became the top five teams in this competition. Uh, so basically the setup is absolutely same. It has two global shutter cameras. It has the initial measurement unit, a RTK uh, uh, GPS, and a LiDAR Velodyne 64. So basically for navigation in Winter City, uh, all uh, LiDAR odometry was done by uh, the team of Skoltec. And basically my D team did a great work for the um, control of the vehicle uh, and also path plan. So if we collected during the uh, research on Oscar platform, we collected the data set uh, of uh, uh, traffic uh, signs in uh, winter conditions and uploaded uh, them online. So basically it's called iVision dataset and it's one of the few in Russia available for um, uh, winter uh, conditions. So if you would like to work with it, please access it. It's available online and you can work, uh, work for your um, task if you need it. But in general, it's one of the key important technology as we did for uh, again, uh, pre-processing, right, to, uh, for indoor robots in, in dark environment. Why, why dark environment? For example, dark stores they, uh, or warehouses, they also would like to save energy and switch off all of the lights, right? So in general, we also need to work in a completely dark environment. And uh, same for the night environment and winter environment is very challenging uh, for navigation. So therefore, we don't need to use just uh, excellent uh, weather condition like in heat environment, but especially for northern countries like Russia, Norway, or um, Finland, or whatever, Canada, we uh, definitely need to make a SLAM technology which is extremely robust in such kind of environment, which is visibility is low, which can partially cover by snow the uh, traffic signs or the traffic light and so on and so on. That is completely more challenging than traditional uh, technologies which currently widely used in SLAM navigation. So recently we started a partnership with um, company Intergrant where my graduate student is uh, working and leading the uh, past planning uh, team and they provided uh, us for free uh, the uh, self-driving cars and recent two months we did the experiments of completely uh, autonomous navigation of this car in Skolkovo um, area and here on the right images you can see the reconstructed uh, image of our Skoltech campus from uh, the uh, set of lighters which are installed on this robot so there are basically three, three lighters uh, Velodyne and also front lighter uh, EBO, also the set of, uh, for sure, tra traditional, it's a stereo camera, GPS sensor, and uh, inertial measurement units. Um, so as a, as a platform which on which we are developing, it's a polar open platform by Baidu, uh, very useful tool to um, deploy our own software as well for self-driving car navigation. So uh, that's it from my side. I just would like to uh, mention that uh, the recently published uh, very good papers. In the future, we are also working on narrow field technologies and uh, in IRAS uh, 2022 in, in Kyoto, in Japan, we will present our new paper, which was accepted not only for IRAS, but also for our tran transaction. And uh, also would like to mention that six uh, years in the row, we became the champions in Russia for uh, autonomous uh, robot competition, which is Eurobot um, uh, competition. So our team is called Reset, and each year we compete with a very excellent team, including the, the Bear team, Mises, and others. Uh, so therefore, uh, I know that Inopolis also competing in this um, um, uh, competition. So please look uh, at my YouTube. Here you can check all videos that I have presented, and even much more. For example, the robot dog and so on publications. Um, and if you would like to ask me any question, please uh, go to Telegram and uh, chat to me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dmitry, for a very nice presentation. So, uh, are, there, are there any questions from the audience from online? Yes. 
Yeah, yeah, I got it. Uh, thank you. I got the question. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. If if you are talking about the lidar technology, right? Uh, so it's it's actually um, it's not exactly. Yeah, it's, it's let's say it's infrared, right? Um, uh, so, and and in general, it can see easily in dark environment. The only one problem for lidar, only one problem for lidar is transparent uh, window. Right for transparent window, uh, it's not only single problem. It's the transparent window because it's, it's no reflection and and a fog, for example. So if, if we have fog, we also can see what is behind. Therefore, typically it's used the ultrasonic sensor. So, uh, however, the question, as I mentioned before, the main topic is now is to avoid using the very expensive lighter, especially now it's critical for uh, Russia as well, right? LiDAR, uh, the technology controlled by a couple of companies, and all of them are located in the United States. Uh, the first one is Veladine company. Uh, there is the Oyster uh, as well, and short one, three companies. Uh, Luminar. And, and, and therefore, uh, it's first of all, they are very expensive and currently difficult, difficult to be uh, <laughs> to, to provide the, the purchase of it, right, and delivery. So therefore, the current uh, trend in robotics is using only cameras for navigation, not use any infrared camera, uh, because from the cameras we can achieve uh, all, basically all required data, because we are humans, right? And we use just visual sensors. We don't use any infrared sensors for navigation. And we do navigation in excellent manner, right? So same for the camera. If we have information from the uh, visual spectrum, so using technology like we proposed and some other people are working, like again, uh, generative adversarial network, we can use only visual data not any infrared data because if uh, the price for example the cheapest i don't know more or less good uh, lighter is about five ten twenty thousand dollars so the price of camera can be just twenty thirty dollars and if you consider for example the robot with the price of car so we never you never be uh, profitable right but if you would like to scale up your technology to use up to 100 200 robots so this robot must be as cheaper as possible and to be able to operate in, in low lighting condition. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any questions from online? So uh, let me ask one more question. Uh, so uh, as far as in this trip for your dark uh, slump, uh, you go from the dark uh, images. Am I right? Yes, yes, absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, so uh, why you uh, why you're going from the dark but not from the normal uh, lighting conditions and generating the uh, the dark samples when you have a, a ground truth with a, a good lighting? Uh, yes, uh, it, it's a good question. Uh, so the idea is to uh, get the data set of real images, so real environment. So and from this real dark environment or shaded semi-dark or dark environment, we need to generate such images so they can be processed by uh, core components in orb slam. So in general, there is no idea to use it just typical images and generate the dark uh, artificially, right? But having the real images that appears in real environment to improve, to process them so that can be readable for uh, SLAM technology. And therefore, basically, the more uh, features we at the end can get, right, feature matches, so the more robust SLAM operation can be achieved. Thank you.
Are there any questions from online? We have one uh, here. Yeah, we'll Mm -hmm. uh, can you repeat? I couldn't hear well. Actually, I didn't hear it well. Maybe you, you can chat it. Um, uh, as I understood, you are talking about localization somehow. But uh, but th this specific research is not about localization. This specific research is how we can navigate in dark environment. All all localization and mapping is done is done by Orb Slam uh, or part. Yeah. I will share your contact with the. Uh, uh, if possible, you can chat so because uh, sometimes I can hear well, actually. So I try to understand the question, but I probably uh, didn't get the idea. I would like to thank, uh, thank you a lot again for your very interesting presentation. And uh, uh, we are going forward. So and we will start our session in uh, seven minutes. Uh, so just uh, seven minutes break, and we will start in 10.20 uh, session. Thank you very much. Uh, so everyone, there's uh, room one of seven for a break. We have coffee and some snacks. We can get there. We are in a break for 10 to 10 20. There's uh, room one of seven. There is like for break. One of seven. One of seven. Yes, yes, at ten twenty. Хочу посмотреть высокие частоты.
Раз, два, три, 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 раз, два, три. Саундчек. Раз, 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 раз. Раз, два, три, раз, два, три. Раз, два, три, раз.
Hello, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes. Sir. All right, thank you. So uh, hello once again. My name is Ivan Borisov and I would like you to present uh, our research, which is. Um, excuse me, I hear myself. Maybe you can turn off your mic. I don't know. Uh, thank you. So um, once again, uh, my name is Ivan. I'm from Itma University, and I would like to present you the research, which is uh, uh, titled as a computational design uh, of closed chain linkages. But basically, it's a part of bigger project, which is uh, focused on finding new approaches uh, and algorithms and methods how can we uh, make uh, design guidelines more formalized uh, and uh, today i will uh, um, uh, explain you our new results regarding the exosuits all right so what what we are doing we're trying to uh, formalize uh, new guidelines. How can we synthesize robotic systems with morphological computation? So what it is? Basically, when we do control, basic control, we do computation algorithmically, right? So we have a controller that, uh, uh, that does computation. But also we can do uh, proper mechanics such that uh, some portion of the desired behavior, the desired dynamics, is already inherent in the mechanics. So, uh, via proper mass distribution, spring allocation, and synthesis of a mechanism, we can create such a robotic system that needs only a small portion of control effort, which is needed only to excite, stabilize or augment the inherent dynamics of the mechanical system. And the previous near conference, we presented our research when we compared a, a typical uh, open chain mechanism, a hopper with the open chain mechanism, which is able to do dynamical locomotion because of the very high torque uh, density motors. And we have compared with the mechanism that is able to do the same dynamical uh, locomotion not not because of very high torque density motors but because of the resonance based behavior of uh, physical elastic elements in the mechanisms so here you can see the uh, the design so and uh, we use all, all very simple control algorithms and the dynamical locomotion is possible due to the proper mechanics uh, that we call morphological computation design algorithm you know all right another example of morphological computation uh, here uh, you can assume that this mechanism is uh, like a finger mechanism and it's fully actuated open chain mechanism. And in order to do grasping behavior for uh, an object, uh, you need very complex control algorithms to control uh, uh, plenty of motors. So here you need as many motors as degrees of freedom. 
And in order to do control, so you need very complex control. You need a lot of motors. You need a lot of sensor here. Uh, and it leads to very high cost, uh, maybe very high, high mass uh, and dimensions, uh, all this stuff. Uh, there is an alternative way what you can do. We can synthesize uh, something like a closed chain mechanism, for example, a four bar linkage. And in this case, you need only one motor and only one sensor to measure the position. But this kind of mechanism will not be adaptive. But you can uh, integrate an elastic element here. So CD, it's like a spring such that it will be adaptive and the mechanism uh, will become an underactuated one. So the problem here is how can we synthesize such kind of mechanisms and what is the guidelines? How can we create such a mechanisms? So and we are working on uh, guidelines. How can we do such kind of uh, uh, synthesis? So here actually you can see one of our examples of a grasping device uh, of a gripper that has uh, four motors and 14 degrees of freedom. So it's a very highly underactuated mechanism and we use only four motors to activate all these 14 degrees of freedom because of the integrated uh, uh, elastic elements such as springs and torsional elastic elements. So, and it's because of the uh, under rotation, it's very highly adaptive and it's able to grasp uh, random objects. And the um, uh, the adaptivity is done only because of the mechanics. The control here is very simple; it's just a position control. And the whole interaction is done only because of the mechanics, the proper mechanics. So we uh, we are telling like. Uh, a portion of control is computed by the mechanical morphology. So I guess the idea is clear. Uh, so there is uh, guidelines that allow us to do control. No, I mean uh, to do synthesis, but mostly the um, those guidelines uh, uh, not very formalized and the design process uh, itself is more like an art than a science and the, the result of the design rely on developer creativity I mean imagination intuition and judgments experience and so on but what we are trying to do is to make it more formalized so let me present you the uh, the main intuition of the method that we proposed. So the idea is the following. When we want to create a mechanism with a morphological computation, we always start with a fully actuated open chain mechanism. And it is the problem of uh, co-design. Co-design, by, by co-design, I mean that we need to find both mechanics and trajectories. So here we look for the topology, uh, we look for the structure, how many links do we need to accomplish the task, how many, uh, what kind of joints do we need to do this, and we look for the parameters, for example, like length of the links, uh, and also we look for the uh, trajectories. What kind of the trajectory trajectories do we need to accomplish the task? And it can be both. It can be done a priori, so we can uh, know from somewhere what kind of motion do we need, or we can do an optimization task itself uh, to find those parameters. Then uh, we do uh, we we synthesize a closed chain mechanism. So we modernize an open kinematic chain, uh, such as we add some additional constraints in order to do this same motion along the same cyclic trajectories. So the intuition is uh, the following: uh, uh, we look for uh, two points that belongs to uh, two links 
but the link that uh, is attached to each other through an intermediate link. It's like we can see the here a uh, link A B and C D. We do not consider C B. So A B and C D. And we look for the points such that the uh, the distance between them varies least. You know, when the distance between the points are the same, it means that we can just simply connect them with the rigid link. And if we we'll introduce this kind of holonomic constraint, we can get rid of a joint. I hope that the intuition is clear. And uh, due to this holonomic constraint, it's possible to get rid of a motor and use a small number of motors to follow the same trajectory. In case if we have multiple trajectories, we can uh, find such points A and F such that if we um, add a link uh, with uh, another length, we will be able to follow another trajectory. And if we want to do all of these trajectories, we can simply create a, a not we can uh, add not a rigid link, but a mechanism that will allow us to control the distance between E and F points. And even we can do this um, passively. And this is how we can actually uh, control the underactuation of our mechanism. So it's very general and basic idea. And let me now be, uh, explain you what have we done with the exosuit. So we have an exosuit that ha has been designed by, by our student. And we are, uh, we are interested now in the torso unit. The torso unit consists of several parts, but basically we can divide it in two parts. The upper part uh, of a torso and the bottom part of the torso. And both of them are connected to each other using a revolute joint. And we would like to just simply verify, is it a good idea that been just um, provided due to the engineering experience and intuition? All right, so we uh, use, use this 3D model of the exosuit. And since it's a passive structure, we do, cannot just animate it. We use uh, uh, motion capture and uh, create those uh, dummies that move along trajectories like a human one. So it's like a upper side and the bottom side of a torso. So here you can see a, a man that uh, basically indicates uh, what are the points here, you know? And this is the 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 assembly and here you can see the animation of uh, of a person that moves and you can see now that the uh, exosuit uh, you know the points uh, here of a revolute joint disconnects and it's mean that the, the design is not very ergonomical so here you actually here you can see it better that the the connection points, the attachment points uh, are disconnected uh, throughout the motion. Uh, so here you can see it more vividly. All right, so uh, what would have been done beforehand? So we tried to do parametric optimization of the connection points. Maybe we can do, we can use a revolute join here but uh, uh, the points are aligned to each other only in the initial rest position. But when the person start to move, the distance between the frames, between these points of, you know, uh, revolute join are disconnected. And the distance between them is up to even eight centimeters. So it's not very ergonomically. So you can still use a revolute join, but uh, uh, there will be much of discomfort for uh, operator. So we try to do uh, optimization of a position. And first, what have we done? We done it only for five seconds 
our rise position just to verify our um, uh, cost function here that you can see on the bottom. But then we can see that the the distance uh, between the points uh, got even higher. And then we try to do the optimization for the whole sequence, and you can see that the distance between the points are very far away from the zero. So parametric optimization is not an option. And what we have done, we have done, we have used the proposed synthesis algorithm. Uh, so, but here. Uh, instead of open kinematic chain, we use a human. So we consider that the human is some sort of um, uh, open kinematic chain, and the exosuit is some kind of a mechanism that uh, imply that impose constraint on human motion. So here you can see that it's like the open kinematic chain here. It's the uh, operator's body that provide the motion, you know, from use motion capture. And we we were looking for um, points C and D such that uh, those are connected to each other, not through a revolute joint as it used to be, but through a additional link, a link CD. And we found that that we found such uh, frames and parameters of the frames that could be connected to each other through a, a link with a length three centimeters. And here you can see that the, uh, throughout the whole motion, the distance between the connection point fluctuates around the, the initial three centimeters. And this is the way how we can actually create uh, do uh, uh, the structure of exosuit uh, more ergonomically. So this is the whole idea. If you're interested, uh, I encourage you to consider reading uh, the paper. You will find more details in the paper and uh, I will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you and that's it for my presentation. Uh, I have a question about the uh, synthesis. Uh, so, you start with the origin and you start uh, uh, optimizing the distance for driving a close one thing that gives you I'm sorry, it's very hard to hear you. Uh, maybe you can, you know, uh, say it in the computer because it's very noisy. Uh, is it better? Yeah, it's much better. Now I can clearly hear you. Okay, uh, so my question is regarding your synthesis method. Uh, when you uh, just start with an open chain and you start trying to solve an equation where it will give you the same distance. But mm -hmm. why don't you just directly use the vector loop equation? that you will have some desired positions directly and you can just for build for each desired position you can build a vector loop equation and you can solve all these equations together i think this will be much faster or or how, how is this uh, different or di or did you try it and didn't help you like uh, here the problem is that we need to uh, add new constraints such that we will be able to follow the same trajectories as an open kinematic chain, but we will gonna use a fewer amount of motors. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that uh, 
each time when we add some links, it could be just a one root link or it can be a group of links, which one is called us or groups. Uh, we can uh, add more constraints will that will take away degrees of freedoms and it will allow us to get rid of motors and then we can introduce again those same uh, motion, but uh, we can uh, make them passive, you know, uh, so we can get rid of active uh, degrees of freedom, but uh, then on later steps, it produce the same degrees of freedom, but make them passive. Yeah, but a vector loop equation directly solves it uh, like for bar mechanism for one degree of freedom. Uh, uh, if you're trying to reduce like the number of active degrees of freedom, vector loop equation directly gives you the like for a single degree of freedom, for example, to control like the same uh, system as you wanted to design, as I understand. A vector loop equation uh, uh, from here. Um, I cannot think that it's possible to use here, you know, uh, that uh, the one that you mentioned, it's, uh, you know, we use it for the kinematic analysis. Is it, no, for synthesis. Do I correctly? No, for synthesis too. For synthesis, mainly for synthesis. So analytical synthesis. Analytical one, but here we, uh, I, I formalize it as the, an optimization task you know uh, it is uh, not possible to find the, an optimal solution but we're looking for the suboptimal solution and we formalize the whole task and optimization task you know uh, here there is a numerous way how can we add constraints we can find multiple ways you know you can uh, add here not just the one link you can add the group of links you can add it for a different kind of links here so there is uh, just a vast uh, space of solution and it's uh, possible to explore this vast uh, space of solution just using global optimization techniques so and this is why i uh, formalized the problem as the optimization problem so we do it not analytically but using optimization techniques you know thank you mm -hmm. i'd like to thank uh, a lot again so we are out of the time already so and let's just move to the next uh, presentation so thank you uh, a lot. thank you uh, so the next uh, presentation will be given by uh, Evgeny Marchuk from at uh, from Napolis University he will talk on the problem of uh, position and orientation errors of large size cable driven parallels please Hello, everyone.
Sound check. Sound check. Sound check. I will give this. Hello there. My name is Yuri. I'm a postgraduate student from Napoleon University. And the theme of my report is uh, problems of position and orientation errors of large sized cable driven parallel order. It combines uh, two concepts. CDPR and uh, CDPR is a cable driven parallel robot and uh, LSAM large scale additive manufacturing. Two words about uh, cable driven parallel robots. Uh, this is relatively new branch in the area of industrial robotics. Uh, usable samples of uh, CDPR were made in the 80s of 20th century, but only at the beginning of 20th uh, century. CDPRs became common things to move payloads in warehouse and, and uh, other areas. Advantages of this uh, type of robots is simplicity of mechanism and scalability. And these advantages is in general how to solve uh, problems uh, of control and design of cable system. About large scale additive manufacturing. Uh, we know what is the, the thing of additive manufacturing and if the printed objects have large size, the process is called large scale additive manufacturing. Special case of this one is 3D printing of constructions, which can be supposed as type of cast in place concrete technology of construction of buildings, but without foam blocks. This is an example of, uh, of uh, printing uh, some type of construction. This is our uh, prototype, but if you can see, this is under activated for cable driven robot. Now, um, eight cable driven robot is observed. We, we see that this device consists of four uh, towers. The fifth edition one is used for, for the holes to be complete. Uh, we see an effector of the robot and we see an example of printed building. Milestones of this project. It was uh, it was started in 2016. For these years, we have been working on some tasks, and now uh, the last step. Mm -hmm. We are going to commercial manufacturing for 3D digital building process. Specific, some specific problems in the model of CDPRs. These typical problems are geometrical and structural non-linearity of cables. <clears throat> the second one is collisions between cables and other cables or obstacles. The third one is oscillations of and effector of the robot because of the sensitivity of cable grid to different kinds of disturbance and uh, probably some other problems uh, for specific cases of uh, this type of problem. Two main assumptions in current problem are non-seeking cables with properties of uh, fact model of viscous elastic bodies. The second assumption is uh, we suppose that towers has properties of uniform vertical Bernoulli beams. We suppose that because of cables are non second cables are stretched strongly, and in such way, geometrical non-linearity has been excluded. Structural non-linearity of cables is represented via inclusion activation functions in the model of cable. Configuration of cable system uh, is given in such way that the absence of collisions is uh, guaranteed for this uh, case of planar curvilinear motion of end effector. 
and a few words about oscillations of the effector of the robot. Uh, the first obvious reason for oscillations is some out disturbance, says the wind. And the second reason is uh, self oscillation of the system. And uh, often the source of uh, it can be incorrect, a given law of motion of the vector. The ways to compensate errors in position and orientation and to reduce oscillations of a defector of the robot have to be found in this work. Three words about kinematics of a cable driven parallel robot. This is a common thing for all CDPRs. The method has been developed by Andreas Pot in, in this way. The dynamics of a cable driven parallel robot. robot to describe in terms of damping oscillations. This is a point model of a viscoelastic body of cables. And the last formula shows us condition of structural non-linearity through activation function, sigmoid activation function. This is a model of uh, towers as vertical wind from Bernoulli beams. And uh, then we discuss uh, the way to estimate the vertical, uh, the errors in vertical coordinate. The idea is based on supposing the errors of uh, in the errors in position of lower proximal anchor points in reliably small. What are lower proximal anchor points? These are proximal anchor points, these are lower and these are upper, and these are distal anchor points, lower and upper. So, according to the model of the memory beams, we suppose that deformations in the lower part of the beam of, the, of our towers are significantly fewer than these deformations in the upper half, especially at the top. Let us consider a horizontal plane uh, and four lower cables are lying in this plane when mobile platform meets given position. And uh, if cables deform under the payload, then plane transforms to truncated rectangular right pyramid. Of course, uh, there is not a rectangular right pyramid but we assume that it almost the pyramid. And now we can find heights of this trapezoid, this trapezoid, and this trapezoid. We can do it. The length of each segment of cable L is obtained as a sum of given length and uh, sum of measured elongation of a cable, which is calculated through hook law. The height of this uh, third trapezoid is the estimated position error in vertical coordinate, this height. Such way we can calculate only the absolute value of estimated error, and we don't know signs of segments of the curve. The ends of cables which are connected to distal anchor points have to be equipped with electronic levels, and this way we know the direction of which cable is related to their proximal anchor points, upward or downward. The way which is proposed below allows to define the signs of segment of the curve via positive or negative angles of rising cables. And then we use procedure of uh, smoothing out function of signal with the sigmoid step function. And the result is shown below. This is uh, this blue line is a calculated height of the third trapezoid. This blue line is a real error in simulation. The red line is uh, the set function, and at the low graph, we can see real and estimated position errors in vertical axis. The mobile platform have to be equipped with gyroscope. 
then the first process is executed via synchronized lifting of all upper cables. Such way we compensate in vertical. Uh, we compensate error in vertical axis. It can be run with PID regulation. And the second process is executed via separate lifting of each upper cable to minimize the error in height of each distal anchor point. It also can be run with uh, PID regulation. So the proposed method is suitable without any additions if there are no external disturbances, such as wind pulsations. In the case of uh, wind pulsations, uh, we have to do some additional activities. In this model, wind pulsations are supposed to have properties of light noise with uh, some frequency and magnitude. The numerical experiment has been carried out. <coughs> Position errors with errors in uh, pitch and draw angles could be compensated satisfactorily with this proposed method, but almost uncontrollable rotation around vertical axis provided uh, torsional vibrations, and these uh, vibrations impact on all dynamic system. To get rid of the oscillations in position errors, the torsional vibrations have to be reduced. Possible way to reduce these torsional oscillations is adding dynamic damper to the mobile platform. This is an example of uh, wind disturbance, and uh, we can see position errors without compensations, and the uh, position errors of center of mass of mobile platform after uh, compensations with proposed algorithms. And uh, these are orientation errors also without compensations and with compensations. We can see that the uh, errors in your around vertical axis are significant. The idea of dynamic damping is to absorb the vibration energy by passing the primary system. Dynamic dampers reduce vibration in the specific frequency domain of this weighting object. These are conditions shown via differential equations. And this is the result in simulation, of course. These are position errors after addition of dynamic damper to the end effector after attachment. And these are orientation errors in the same scale. We can see that orientation errors has been reduced significantly. And these are angles of rotation of the damped mass of the damper and of main object. Blue line shows angle of rotation of uh, mass of dynamic damper, and the red one shows the rotation of the main object. The simulation has been run with the given properties of cable driven parallel robot. Uh, the linear dimensions of system is uh, about tens of meters. For example, height of towers uh, is 15 meter, and the uh, edges of uh, of the rectangular box space is 20 meters. Mass of a mobile platform of an defector is uh, 350 kilograms, and mass of dynamic jumper is uh, 50 kilograms. The platform is moving on planar curvilinear trajectory at height about uh, four or five meters, and the upper limit for smoothly changing speed of motion is 0 0.15 meters or uh, 15 centimeters per second. The main obtained result is a significant reducing of position and orientation errors of mobile platform of the robot. It has been shown that the uh, impact of deformable structures of the robot and some external disturbances can be substantially reduced with controlling the cable system and uh, with attachment to passive dynamic damper to the mobile platform. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you for your questions on 
line of I lost the one on my side. So, uh, what uh, extra uh, extra applications of these uh, results can uh, can you imagine? So, ways can be used also apart from particular application which you can take us. I think uh, this uh, result can be applicated to uh, to specific cases of. Uh, over rotated cable driven uh, robots. Uh, this is uh, not a result for general cases. Uh, and this is. Um, I think this is a good result for uh, large sized uh, systems. Because we. We uh, have done this work for. For particular case. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thanks for the next presentation and let us uh, move forward. So the next presentation will be given by uh, uh, Kazan Tiapu, uh, sorry, correctly from uh, Moscow uh, Power Engineering Institute. Uh, he will talk uh, on uh, uh, comparative uh, analysis of the uh, dynamics of a spherical robot with a balanced internal platform, taking into account different models of conduct friction. So please use your time, share your screen to good day. Uh, uh, can you hear me and see my presentation? Yes, you're good to go. Okay. Okay. Uh, I would like you to present a report on the topic uh, comparative analysis of the dynamics of a spherical robot with a balanced internal platform, taking into account different models of contact friction. Uh, currently, research on uh, mobile wheeled robots that are capable uh, of omnidirectional movement has become popular. Uh, one of the most widely used ways to achieve the possibility of omnidirectional movement is uh, the use of a spherical or omnidirectional uh, wheels, uh, present on figure 2. In the review of the principle of spherical robot control uh, can be found in uh, two papers uh, on the slide. Um, one of the most uh, common control principles is as associated with uh, changing center mass uh, of spherical robot, uh, the creation of gyrostatic uh, moments, and equipping uh, with internal omnidirectional platform. Applications of uh, mobile uh, spherical robots. Uh, is uh, wide, uh, such as surveillance, uh, environment monitoring, petrol, and uh, underwater and winter exploration. Spherical robots can be used as amphibious robots uh, available on land as well as underwater. In the work, some authors uh, on the slide uh, will present uh, was presents a kinematic model that can be used to calculate the angular velocities of uh, Mecano wheel for rectilinear trajectories at arbitrary speeds. Uh, and uh, for curvilinear trajectories, uh, only in the case of low speeds. As a direction for future research, it's singled out uh, to develop uh, a dynamic model which takes into account the slippage of the omni wheel rollers, the characteristics of the wheel and the design of control order based on this model. Uh, to eliminate charge uh, motions after completing control, it's proposed to use elementary maneuvers uh, that allow the robot to switch from a one stationary movement to another. Uh, the purpose of research uh, 
Next, uh, development of a dynamic model for a spherical robot with an internal platform equipped with four classic omni wheels. Development of program control of the movement of robot and a numerical simulation uh, based movements for a spherical robot. Uh, describing the motion of a spherical robot, uh, the following assumptions are made. At the center of mass of the spherical robot. The spherical shell and the internal omni platform uh, coincide and are located in the, the geometric center of the sphere. Uh, the omni platform moves translationally, and the simplified model of omni wheels is used. And there is no slippage at the point on the, of the omni wheel rollers along their axis with the spherical shell. And uh, uh, for uh, one of the model, the contact interaction with the floor is a point contact, and for another model, dynamics uh, robot, uh, the contact uh, we have a contact area. The kinematic scheme of uh, the robot is presented on this slide. We have a spherical shell and uh, internal platform. Uh, C1, C2, C3, C4 is the uh, geometric center of omni wheels. Uh, and uh, we use moving uh, coordinate system C, X, C, X, Y, Z uh, uh, with the region at the geometric center of the sphere. Uh, P is the center of the contact area, the sphere with the supporting surface. And uh, C is the uh, heading angle for uh, our robots. This kinematic uh, model may be, uh, it can be. Uh, Expressed by uh, equation one and two, where uh, first equation is the um, uh, equation of non slip uh, conditions uh, for uh, point of contact controllers uh, of ice on the wheel. Uh, omega uh, SX, uh, Omega S, uh, Omega S, Z is uh, uh, projection of uh, angular velocity uh, of sphere on uh, moving axis C, X, Y, Z. The model of the dynamics of the spherical robot obtained under the condition of non slippage of the sphere at the contact point is presented on the slide. We consider two cases of describing the dynamics of spherical robot. First is the case of sphere moving without slipping at the point of contact with the supporting surface. Of course, this, we have such equations dynamics. And second case is uh, taking into account the sliding, spinning, and the rolling friction at the contact area during the spherical robot motion. Uh, according to the obtained model, it's clear that the motion of the spherical robot can be described uh, by a system of uh, three dynamics equation uh, and uh, six kinematic equations uh, that was presented on uh, this slide. And uh, in the second case, we have a dynamics model of spherical robot uh, in uh, next form. Uh, in this case, uh, of take, uh, taking at, we take into account uh, the sliding, rolling, and spinning friction of the spherical uh, shell relative to the floor. We have a contact spot. Uh, the motion of the spherical robot can be described using a system of, of five dynamics equations and um, four equations uh, uh, that uh, express. Uh, non-slippage non conditions uh, for omni -wheels. In this case, to close, to close the system of equations, it's necessary to redefine the friction model uh, for 
of torques uh, for rolling uh, friction torques m x m i uh, and uh, spin friction torque and and, that. and also uh, sliding forces friction f y f x we can consider the model of multi component friction uh, that was uh, used uh, in uh, paper on slide uh, for describing uh, dynamics of uh, gold. Uh, this model uh, has the form uh, five, equation five uh, for our robots, uh, where uh, uh, P is a a radius of contact spot uh, that's, uh, uh, assumed, assumed uh, be a token. Program control of robot motion. Uh, to perform uh, elementary maneuvers, the control torques can be calculated in the form of program control uh, or uh, forward feedback. Using the pseudo inverse matrix method, the system uh, three is a dynamic model on is solved with respect to the control torques uh, where f y m z and f x is the right side of, of this equation uh, you can see as elementary maneuvers of spherical robot uh, such as uh, moving and straight line on the c x and c y Access which consumes speed P. We have uh, next uh, values of program control torques. And also we can uh, see uh, the program control torques uh, for rotation uh, around the vertical axis. On this slide, we have a simulation results uh, for driving in a straight line. Uh, we use next uh, numerical values of parameters, mathematical model. And uh, on the graph, we have next notifications. Model one is a simplified model that uh, was describing by sorry dynamic equation. And model two is uh, dynamics model two. Uh, which uh, describing uh, by uh, five equation of dynamics. It can be seen uh, from the graph that the found program control provides program moon at the end of a uh, transition. Based on the simulation results, it can be concluded that at low speeds of a spherical robot, it's allowed to use model one obtained under the condition of non slippage of the sphere and under the assumption of the point contact. Uh, but uh, uh, at high speeds of movement, a uh, spherical robot, uh, the influence of the model contact friction, uh, contact friction of a spherical robot with the supporting surface is manifested or so have a difference between two dynamics models. Uh, uh, with program control for movement along the uh, rhombus uh, trajectory in model one, the simulation results show pure movement along the trajectory for simplified model. Uh, with program control for movement along the rhombus in model two, uh, the simulation results uh, show that the trajectory of the geometric center deviates from uh, the program movement, uh, this arises uh, arise, uh, from taking into account slippage in the area of the contact between the sphere and the supporting surface. Uh, in this case, uh, the speed of uh, motion of spherical robot uh, was uh, about 0 0.4 meters per second. Uh, at the same time, if we consider the movement along the rhombus uh, with different speeds, we will notice that this deviation in the trajectory from the programmed move movement increase non-linearly with increasing speed. Uh, of course, in this case, uh, speed of robot will be 
say, or uh, zero point one, or this zero point four, and uh, one point seven. Uh, the results of the study are presented on the slide. Uh, the main results is uh, the development and all hallmark models of the dynamics of spherical robot with different levels of detail for the contact friction model. Uh, the simulation of motion was carried out and the applicability of the proposed control for model one. Uh, where we have a point contact and using non slip condition uh, for omni wheels. Uh, and uh, in model two, uh, where are we taking account uh, the slippage of the sphere, as uh, there is a non linearly increasing in deviation from the program movement, uh, as it was showed, uh, an example of movement along a rhombus, with an increasing in the speed of the program movement. Uh, thanks for your attention. That's it. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from the audience from the line? Mm -hmm. What's so, your question? Uh, no questions. I will ask uh, Mark on that side. So, can you, uh, can you give us hi uh, highlights where we can apply uh, the spherical robots and uh, which benefits uh, in practice we will get from these results? Okay. Uh, these results we can uh, apply it in uh, development of control system. Uh, our results uh, show that. Uh, Taking into account uh, multi component contact friction is uh, potent uh, for accuracy uh, movement of robot. Uh, uh, and uh, spherical uh, robot applications uh, is uh, widely and uh, such, uh, such as uh, petrol or uh, surveillance. Mm. And that's it. Yep. Uh, there, uh, there's uh, one more question. So, Sergey, please. Uh, so, uh, you had a slide where you uh, showed uh, friction. Uh, three component friction with uh, yeah the slide and after this this one uh, you next said that you use uh, in metric pseudo inverse method to compute torques, right? On the next slide, uh, I think. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, I. Yeah, well, one second. Uh, so you you said that you use pseudo inverse method to compute torques. Does it mean that you have always have a solution to the uh, problem of? You know, finding torques that implement your motion, and you have uh, to choose one out of multiple solutions. Or is it possible that you have no solution, and this so the inverse method provides you the closest, uh, least residual approximation? Okay, I understand your question. Uh, I show the slide. Uh, in this slide, we have a dynamic model uh, where. Uh, we uh, substitute uh, program movement with x, y, y, and omega s, z, and uh, calculate f, x, f, y, m, z. After this, we use uh, notation for right uh, side of this equation and can calculate uh, control torques m1, m2, m3, m4. Uh, we have uh, three equations uh, and uh, four unknown, uh, four variables, uh, control torques. Uh, we uh, we choose one of uh, uh, many solutions of this equation, uh, and the pseudo inverse uh, matrix method. Uh, uh, which we uh, used is the uh, uh, least square. Uh, we uh, 
minimize uh, the uh, sum of squares uh, control cores. Thank you. Uh, thank you once more. Uh, so we are a little bit out of the time. Okay, so uh, so let's uh, let's move to the next presentation. Next uh, presentation will be uh, given by Yuri Kazakov uh, from uh, Oral State uh, University. So uh, he will talk about uh, uh, reducing the rotor vibrations in active uh, 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 conical fluids uh, films uh, bearing with the control of the game. So please you share your screen and use your time for presentation. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, so can you turn off your micro, please? I hear yourself. Oh, thank you. Uh, good day, dear colleagues. My name is Yuri Kazakov, and uh, I represent uh, the Department of Mechatronics, Mechanics and, Roboti and Robotics of the Oral State University. And today I would like to present uh, our work reducing rotor vibration in active conical fluid film bearings with the uh, controllable gap. So let's start. Uh, people often take over ideas from nature. However, ways uh, movement in nature and uh, in engineering are different. Uh, in nature, uh, creators uh, use uh, forward and uh, backward motion, but people use the rotation movement. Uh, you can see this uh, type of movement in cars, uh, aircraft, power machines. Sorry, I interrupt you. You shared another screen, and uh, we uh, we can see that you changed the slides. Oh, sorry, what? Uh, you uh, you shared another screen, I guess, because we see uh, we see only the uh, first slide. Uh, that is not a uh, full screen mode. Oh. Oh. H how can uh, I do it? Please help me. Uh, so you need uh, uh, when you share uh, Sharon, you share just the uh, another screen, I guess. You could share your entire screen, yeah. not just a window. Oh, OK. Oh. Yes, yeah. perfect. Th yeah, th that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, oh, OK, uh, people often take over ideas from nature, uh, but uh, uh, always uh, uh, Avaise movement uh, in nature and uh, in engineering uh, are different. Uh, people use uh, uh, rotation movement, uh, and uh, you can see this uh, type of movement uh, in car, cars uh, and aircraft uh, and uh, power machines uh, and etc. And uh, all these machines uh, use uh, rotors. Uh, today, rotor bearing system includes shaft and uh, information measuring system and bearings. Uh, th there are main two types uh, of bearings uh, with contact interaction and uh, contactless. Contact interaction bearings include rolling bearings uh, and sliding bearings. Contactless bearings include fluid film bearings and uh, electromagnetic bearings. And uh, contactless uh, bearings uh, have uh, uh, have low wear and uh, they can mm, at high speed. Uh, so fluid film bearing, uh, fl fluid film bearings uh, due to wedge effect. Uh, also, you can see this effect when car when car drives uh, into paddle at high speed. Mm. And uh, this is due to the fact. Uh, that the surface have different speed and uh, a lifting force occurs due to the speed gradient. If the velocity gradient is greater, then the lifting force is uh, greater too. Uh, today, uh, there are uh, three main uh, approaches uh, to modeling uh, rotor dynamics. Uh, rotor, a rotor is uh, uh, presented uh, as a single mass model or rigid uh, body model or flexible rotor. 
and uh, these models uh, include uh, Bering model. Uh, Bering model can be linear model or non-linear model. Uh, linear model have uh, uh, stiffness and damping coefficient, and uh, these coefficients uh, determine um, the type of uh, uh, rotor movement. Non-linear model is based uh, on the calculation of uh, lifting force uh, at every time step. Uh, so, um, fluid film bearing, uh, fluid film bearings uh, have uh, uh, the gap between uh, uh, between shaft and uh, uh, and a bearing is uh, very small and. Uh, uh, as a result, uh, high vibration can lead uh, high vibrations can lead the, uh, lead to contact between uh, the shaft and uh, the bearing, uh, and uh, this phenomenon often leads uh, to wear and uh, damage. And uh, we could see this uh, phenomenon uh, on Sayana Sushinska power station. Uh, there was an accident. Uh, and uh, uh, we have created uh, test reconception with the active bearing uh, and uh, rotor simulation model in Simulink. Uh, so our test uh, reconception with the active uh, bearing um, include controller, include uh, actuator and some sensors. Uh, it uh, also includes uh, electric motor, motor uh, coupling, shaft, uh, servo valve. Um, there are um, conical, active conical bearing and uh, damping element in uh, uh, bearing assembly. Uh, so our main idea uh, is uh, um, actuator generate force on uh, the and face sleeve, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, as a result, sleeve can uh, move to forward or back, and uh, uh, and this phenomenon uh, creates uh, uh, velocity gradient, and uh, as a result, uh, uh, create its uh, its change uh, lifting force. Uh, so our simula simulation model in Simulink uh, is based uh, uh, on test rig conception. Uh, this model includes shaft, coupling, electric motor, and uh, be conical bearing uh, models. Uh, also, this includes uh, uh, some equations such as imbalance force, damping element reaction, and uh, end phase force. Uh, there are two artificial neural networks. Uh, uh, to uh, we uh, we used uh, these networks uh, uh, to uh, calculate uh, our lifting force and uh, uh, torque. And uh, mm, so uh, uh, we. Uh, we we trained uh, we we trained our uh, neural network uh, to uh, approximate uh, to approximate uh, uh, this uh, equation, uh, and uh, uh, we had uh, good results. Uh, you can see here comparison uh, solution of the Reynolds equation and the approximation by an N. Uh, we we have created uh, uh, two controller. Uh, here you can see adaptive peak controller conception. Uh, this uh, this conception includes uh, environment uh, controller button and lamp. Uh, lamp change your color when coordinates uh, of the rotor. Uh, go our uh, go our critical gap value. And uh, we can use, uh, uh, and uh, we can activate our controller. Uh, 
uh, adaptive p controller is uh, based on uh, simple p controller uh, but uh, there is a uh, year function and uh, here you can see uh, rotor trajectories when cut uh, when controlled by the adaptive p controller uh, with, with control and without control and uh, trajectories with uh, control uh, is uh, smaller than without control uh, and uh, uh, it's good result uh, so second uh, uh, second shower controller is uh, uh, based uh, DQN agent. Uh, here you can see DQN agent conception. Uh, uh, this conception includes environment, uh, DQN agent, uh, and uh, some input parameters. Uh, DQN agent uh, have uh, uh, five different uh, uh, five different values output signal. Uh, such as uh, minus five, uh, minus one, uh, plus one, and plus five, and zero. Uh, this value is in uh, Newton, uh, and uh, we use the oh, this block uh, is running sum uh, to accumulate uh, uh, output signal. Uh, uh, you can see parameters uh, of the DQN agent, and uh, uh, also you can see our uh, reward, fu reward function. Uh, at each time step, the DQN agent uh, receives uh, the reward of one if the assertion is smaller than uh, critical gap value, uh, and uh, otherwise uh, the reward is equal zero. Uh, and uh, uh, agent have a penalty of minus 50 is uh, applied when the actual displacement of the shaft is more than uh, 1.5 millimeters or smaller minus uh, 0.7 millimeters or, or the shaft uh, touch the bearing and uh, here you can see uh, our results um, um, and uh, trajectories with control uh, smaller than uh, smaller than without control, mm. and uh, it's a really good uh, result. Uh, so, mm. after analyzing our work, uh, we can draw some conclusions. Uh, active conical bearing uh, uh, does a good job uh, at reducing vibrations. Uh, and uh, our controllers were able to reduce rotor vibration. However, uh, the adaptive P controller can operate uh, within a narrow range of parameters. Mm. Uh, and uh, deep learning controllers uh, work much uh, better in complex systems, such as uh, rotor systems. Uh, However, uh, the learning time, um, however, uh, they have a very long time often. So, thank you. Thank you, Yuri, for this nice presentation. Uh, so, are there any questions from the audience or from online? So, if uh, there are no, I have one from my side. So, uh, how sophisticated the simulink model that you implemented to test the hypothesis? Mm. Uh, so, uh, we we had experience uh, uh, to create uh, a real object model uh, in simulink, and uh, uh, we hoped. Uh, uh, we hoped to uh, this model uh, give us uh, uh, opportunity uh, test our uh, test our controllers. Uh, our main idea in paper uh, is uh, 
uh, created uh, controllers uh, for uh, active billions. Uh, and uh, uh, just we uh, and just uh, we could uh, and 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 just uh, s sorry and just we uh, we wanted uh, to to how it work Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, um, it was mute. It was mute. Thank you. Yes, yes, we can hear, uh, hear you. So we are moving to the next uh, presentation. And next oh, presentation. So we'll thank you. Uh, will be delivered by Valid Shakir from Minneapolis University, who will talk on the steepness analysis with the double pantograph transmission system. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wali Chakir, uh, and in this work, uh, stiffness uh, modeling is implemented for double pantograph uh, transmission system. And the importance of stiffness modeling for for modeling structure is we need to improve the overall accuracy of the of the models by uh, calculating the difference between the actual pose and desired pose uh, to improve uh, the overall accuracy. Uh, the stiffness modeling is implemented using the virtual joint modeling and the matrix structure analysis, and the posts are compared in terms of the uh, results value, results deflection values, and the computational cost. So there is such motivation to do such, this work, uh, in which recent, recently uh, parallel manipulators are used for as a machine tool, and uh, because of their uh, advantage over the serial manipulator. And because of that, we need to pay much attention to the uh, machine tool accuracy. Uh, so uh, for the double bantu graph, uh, in which anyone is not familiar with, it's just called as a scissor lifting mechanism. It is one degree of freedom uh, controlled by a prismatic joint, which is uh, horizontally. And it's mainly used for uh, lifting and landing uh, uh, applications. So in literature, we have three methods for uh, to, play, to compute the stiffness uh, modeling. Uh, first one is the finite element uh, analysis, in which is the most accurate one. However, it's uh, the most expensive one, actually, I mean computationally. Uh, MSA tries to handle this problem by some approxima approximation, and the VGM can be considered as the easiest and fastest one, and we're gonna see this later. However, it has such a problem to uh, model uh, such structures, and we're going to figure out what could be a reason for that. The kinematics for this model is, is uh, straightforward. We have two chains started with uh, the lower local frame, and it ends with the upper local frame. Uh, so this table presents the kinematic parameter for, for each chain. And the inverse kinematics is much easier. We have just the height of the we given the, the height of the uh, robot in which we can calculate the horizontal stroke, and uh, consequently we can compute the uh, the prismatic, the active prismatic joint and the passive joints. It is very important for such a structure to have uh, some structural limits. So uh, to to avoid uh, driving the robot, we then uh, like exceeding these these limits and not to affect the the stiffness results. So we studied both both cases in which the manipulator is completely compressed and, and which is, is, is like completely uh, expanded. And we tried not to drive the 
the, the row within these uh, limits. So uh, we assume that we have uh, cylindrical uh, beams and we have the general uh, 3D uh, stiffness matrix for, for beam equation in which we use the, uh, these equations. So for VGM, we have uh, the kinematic chain. We have two chains. So each chain is presented as active prismatic joint followed by passive joint and then link, and then passive joint followed by another link. When we try to expand this kinematic chain, we can expand it. Uh, the active prismatic joint can be expanded with one virtual spring. However, the rigid link could be expanded by six virtual springs, as presented in this equation. So after, compu after computing the uh, Cartesian stiffness, classical Cartesian stiffness matrix for, for each chain, we can aggregate it. In our case, it's 13 by 13 matrix, uh, in which we have one active joint and two sub matrix, 6 by 6 for each link. So after aggregating, we, have, we can end up with this equation in which we can add the uh, stiffness matrix for, for each link, and we're going to see why this equation can be uh, such a problem in, 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 in VGM, actually. After we get the total stiffness matrix, we can compute the, uh, the deflection using uh, Hoxie law. So uh, we say it like the fastest and easiest one because we have sequence of positions. We can we compute the inverse kinematics. Then we, we got the uh, calculated Jacobian. Then after that, the stiffness matrix, and we end up with deflection. The second approach was the matrix structure analysis. Uh, in, in our case, we have 21 nodes, and this table presents the connection nodes and the connection type for each two nodes. We have rigid joints, which are represented by the red ellipse, and the passive joints, which are represented by the passive, uh, by the yellow ellipse. Uh, following the equation, the standard equation that uh, presents the constraints for, for each type of, con of connection that we're going to use to aggregate the system equation. It should be noted that uh, when implementing the MSA, we need to transform the local stiffness matrix to the global stiffness matrix using the rotation matrices. Practically, we, we implemented a program that we just give the uh, connection type and the connection nodes, and it does the aggregation, the whole aggregation itself. So uh, after the aggregation, we end up with rectangular matrix, uh, which represents the system equations, uh, like 288 by 252. So, and it seems that like the system, our system is over constrained. So, since this matrix is not invertible, we cannot use the uh, log inversion me method to compute the, the KC as we used previously. So, the idea is that we need to compute the smallest two norm solution at, at the same time uh, that provides the least residual solution through this equation. So we we know that the um, uh, the residual the the norm of this residual uh, like coincide with with, the, with with this guy. So uh, the solution can be given by pseudo inverse uh, uh, solution. So after we got the this x this x represents the whole range and the whole deflection for for the twenty one node we have. We can uh, extract the deflection at the end point by extracting the last six elements of the of the vector x we have for this equation. So uh, the sequence for MSA is uh, we have like two more steps in which we calculated the uh, rotational matrix, the Q matrices that maps from local uh, stiffness matrices to the global ones, and the matrix aggregation. That's why it's uh, like we have more steps in MSA. So uh, for the results, we have uh, when we applied like 100 Newton force in X axis and, and MSA, we got uh, about like 2. Point, the maximum deflection was 2.4 times 10 to the power negative 4 uh, meter. However, in VGM, we got a very, very huge uh, deflection value, and we're going to discuss why we got such uh, deflection when we applied the force in X axis. However, when we applied the 100 Newton force in Y on Y axis, we got um, some reasonable and sensible results. Uh, I mean, the flexion value between MSA and VGM. When we apply the, when we apply the 100 Newton force in that direction, we, we still have the same problem uh, we had in, in X axis. We got 
very, very huge deflection values in, 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 in z-axis. And the reason for that, in VGM, when we, uh, when we model the system, we didn't introduce any constraint that uh, match these two revolute joints that connect the two legs. So we have, imagine that we have these two legs without the two revolute joints between the, between the two legs, and we just applying the force in, in, in X or in Z direction. That's why we got a very, very huge uh, results uh, when we applying uh, forces using VGM. So uh, the problem again is that equation we used in, in VGM because we didn't introduce any constraint. There's no way to introduce any constraint in, in, uh, in VGM using this equation. Uh, so that's why VGM can have such a problem to model uh, this structure. However, VGM results can be enhanced by uh, try to drive the, the, the matrix for the whole system, starting from the potential energy uh, equation and then adding the constraint. And in our case, the physical interpretation for these constraints that's going to be added to the Lagrange function would be the two passive revolute joints that connect to the two legs. Uh, it, it, it can be done in, in, in our future work. So, um, as a result, we only have sensible deflection values in, in when, when we apply the forces in, in Y direction. Uh, that's why we're going to compare the MSA and VGM in, in, in Y direction. Uh, so, uh, we still have some difference between results, and it's also uh, because of the that we missed some constraint in, in, in VGM and it somehow affects the results of the, of the Y axis. Uh, but still we have some reasonable and sensible results than uh, X axis and, and Z axis. Uh, so uh, computationally we found that when we, when we uh, drive the, the, boat, the robot to the uh, 30 point in the worker space, so it takes around 2.77 seconds in MSA while VGM take like more three seconds to reach the same uh, results. Uh, in conclusion, we found that MSA has less computational cost and no limitation to model such a structure as VGM. Uh, Seventy-six percent is the maximum. It's the difference at the maximum uh, deflection value. It is not the, for the whole graph. It's just one for one point, which is the maximum uh, difference. And in our case, in our case, it's like four. It is presented in the right one, which is the higher point, which is four times ten to the power negative three. So this seventy-six percent is the for the last. I mean, the maximum deflection value. Not, not for all points we have. Uh, um, it is not, and I say that in, in this, this results when we apply the forces in the axis of rotation, which is Y axis. And um, it, it can be because of we missed the constraint I talked about in the, in the VGM, because we didn't introduce any constraints that connect the two links.
Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to present uh, the paper uh, we work on uh, for gravity compensator for prismatic join. Uh, this part or this paper is a part of our bigger theme project, which is more related to embodied intelligence on mechanical systems. Uh, which we're aiming mainly to create uh, systems with more energy conserving elements inside on mechanical level. So uh, I'm going to start uh, what is like the, describing the problem and I'm going to move on to the explaining the concept on one degree of freedom system, uh, moving to two degrees of freedom system, which uh, will be more descriptive. Uh, and then I will present the results and conclusion in this part. Uh, so, um, if we speak about gravity compensation, uh, gravity compensation in nowadays robotics, they are also applied, but on more limited uh, versions. So, in modern robotics or nowadays robotics, especially in the bigger scale ones, we can find some gravity compensators mounted on these robots. For example, here there are two different ways. For example, if spring based compensator so, or pneumatic based compensator. So these are some elements mounted on the elbow joint or like the base joint of this robot just to enhance or to reduce the applied torque on these robots based on uh, their own gravity or their own weight and to support this robot so, so it will reduce the torque applied on these two legs. Previously, uh, it was used. Uh, more of counterweight uh, approach, and in this example here, uh, the electrical motors are mounted on the other side, so they can produce the counterweight or they can enhance the torque applied on this one or in this zone. Uh, some other uh, approach is the auxiliary system, which is just an external mechanism, just holding the end effector and just generating some counter force that can reduce the total energy or the total torque applied on the robot joints in this case. So moving more specific, uh, for example, here are some examples for uh, gravity compensators or compensators designed for regular joints. So here, the first one on the left, this is uh, an example of auxiliary system based on two uh, springs, uh, and they're dealing with the rotation of the rotating link. So because of the rotation, uh, there are two orthogonal functions uh, like operating with sine and cosine, and each of them and these two springs, they represent the two complementary functions in this case. On the right side, this is just uh, also a spring-based compensator, where just the rotation of the uh, of the link is met by a counter torque uh, generated by this spring uh, that's connecting some fixed base and uh, some point on this link. Uh, this this example will be more clear a little bit later during the uh, elaboration. Uh, moving on to and this part actually is like was studied for a long time, and there are a lot of research about that. However, what made us move to prismatic joint that we have very limited we have very limited research about this part. Most of the research we found is like mostly represented here in this slide. They were mostly old patents. And uh, they were mostly from 1950s, 1960s, 70s. They, they were not a new research conducted. In this part. And if we can see here, um, like these systems to operate, they consume a lot of like a big space. And uh, this is not very efficient to include in uh, a robotic manipulator system. So these are more for base, uh, like the base link, for example, or and also they, all of these uh, examples, they don't consider orientation around some rotational uh, uh, point. So moving to our own concept. So here is like the for the first part where I'm just here uh, for one of system. So if we have here just a prismatic joint fixed vertically at some arbitrary position, and if we so here the effort of this joint is just the mass of this moving part multiplied by the gravitational uh, acceleration. So this is the effort spent by the equator to maintain this part in place. Uh, so maybe we can just add, uh, in this case, we can just add a spring uh, with some pretension 
uh, is known, and it will can it can create a counter force uh, that can statically balance this part. And just to how to calculate this free tension, just mg over k. So the, so it's a function of the mass, the gravitational acceleration, and k. So it will produce us this free tension. But in the case of uh, prismatics and orogenic in general, this part is moving and just adding a spring in here is not really efficient because once this part moves, so this this string will not have a complete effect or the effect that we desire. So here on the right, this is like some proposed mechanism that can actually generate a fixed force or a constant force along the span of the uh, of the sun. So while the joint is moving, this like gear mechanism just rotates in a reverse direction that can just unwind uh, this uh, wire that's holding the 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 link and keep the same free tension constant along the the way. Uh, which I'm because here in this uh, uh, configuration we have like the spring is supporting or like the 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 link is hang between two. Uh, spring, uh, sorry, uh, wire wire segment. So it's just like here the force needed, just have the tension in this uh, segment, and just the uh, the uh, the span or like uh, how much un uh, winding of uh, of the wire is needed, which is delta f, is just by the double of the actuation thing. So we need to have here this transmission is one to two uh, uh, transmission ratio. So and uh, this is. Describing the compensation, how can be done? Just one single configuration, which is just a vertical configuration. But what if we want to uh, uh, add more complexity? If we want to consider also rotation, if this is not a base uh, joint, but it's mounted as a second or third joint, where it's changing orientation all this time. And in this case, this is uh, like the amount of uh, effort needed by the prismatic joint is changing also according to the span of motion, of linear motion, and also the rotational angle that uh, it depends on the resolution of forces or of the rotational force along the normal axis. So uh, here, so we, we consider this two dot where the first joint is rotational, rotates with angle Q1, and the second joint is uh, uh, prismatic and moves with uh, distance Q2. And we have here uh, the first mass of the first link at distance LC1, and we have the center of mass of the second link is LC2, and LC2 is just some constant or minimum distance plus the span Q2 of the uh, actuator itself. So uh, here, so this is this is the torque generated in these two joints. So the first joint, the, the base one, is just this is the expression representing this torque. And uh, so LC2 here in, inside, there's Q2. So here, this is a function of two variables, Q1 and Q2. And T2 is also uh, a function of um, Q1 because just the normal, it, it doesn't matter what is the span of motion on the second joint, but it matters what the orientation is in this. So the first part, we are going to try to compensate the variation in this force uh, based on uh, uh, just for the, the translational part and then we move on to rotational part. So for translational part, now we have added the other part, which is just sine Q1, which didn't exist before. And to present this, uh, we will need to present this pin slot mechanism. So this pin slot mechanism, so if you have point O and there's point B, they are a fixed point. And we have this slot that can freely uh, slide around point B, and it can always pass through point O. So we can have this variation where, uh, so this is at configuration with theta equals zero. So we can see that point B uh, or like the, the, the slider is at a vertical, vertical configuration. But if this theta changes, it will force this slider to go back, and we will have this distance S which is just represented as the, the R, which is the distance between O and P, multiplied by sine of theta. So this is exactly the same function. So we could generate the same function. We could just add the, with the same spring we have, multiplied by the distance 
be uh, like we have, which generate the counter force that should compensate this uh, gravity force, which we can easily from here. We have only one million function over here. They're completely simple, and we can just add here the constant k one to like measure. And this is this is the concept in this for this is for translation. But moving to rotational motion, rotational motion. Uh, also, we need to compensate for the base uh, joint, which also will be affected by the motion of the of the linear joint. So what, every time the linear joint or the prismatic joint moves, it shifts the center of mass, which will introduce a different uh, value of torque. So in, in this case, uh, we will add two. Uh, we try to add two springs. So these two springs are uh, mounted between a fixed reference, uh, external reference. And uh, some point on the main system. So the first uh, one, or between point C and D, is just fixed on the at some distance C from uh, from the fixed reference, and distance D from the center of rotation around. It. And between A and D, A is a fixed point on the reference, and point D is on an adaptive fiber. And we will explain how to do that. So for the first uh, 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 spring, we have this is the vector represents point D, and point C is just some some forming on the vertical axis. So, so this is this is the position of point D, and if we do cross product between uh, these two points, point D and C, we will get this expression for counter, yeah, which is uh, very similar to the part of the equation. For the second part, we have here this slider, which here, this is responsible for the moving mass. Once, once this slider moves, this point B should also be moving to, to adapt to the new uh, mass configuration, which is also done by here. So we will, we will call this span as some constant D plus Q star, which is a, a fraction of the Q uh, two span, uh, which should, uh, yeah, so so this is, uh, should be, uh, so this is a counter force from both springs or both functions generated in this case, and this is the original torque that we need to compensate for, and if we count these two parts, we should actually find corresponding elements or corresponding terms to compensate, completely compensate this part. Uh, so, which actually explains or like uh, give us the result that we want. We can actually compensate the gravity, or we can compensate this term using these two springs because we can generate the exact same function. Uh, one thing that we need to consider in here is like how this ha can happen with the moving mass. So here, in this from these previous two equations, we can actually put come up with k two, which is just a constant with the uh, the thickness of the first spring, and for the second spring, we will have here. This is a function of q still, and this cannot happen because k three should be a constant. So, which means the only solution here that this fraction should be a constant value, which will happen uh, by just uh, trying to create a constant uh, transmission between those. So, if this, according to this mechanism. This mechanism is just point B is just sliding with a fraction transmission using this gear transmission here. Uh, it can, we can, for example, if we if we can just create a fraction between this uh, span and the span of point B, which is explained by this uh, graph. So if we apply this to some fixed uh, ratio, we can actually see what is the span. So if, for example, here one to one. We can actually add uh, a link length of one meter, so we can actually find that it's actually to compensate completely. This point B should extend beyond the length of the of the of the link. But if we, for example, use one to two, we can, we already can see that it it, it can it be like a point B can extend just before or like in a span less than the length. And of course, if the more you increase the ratio, the transmission ratio, the less span you need for motion. Or for passive adaptation, which is described as a passive adaptation. So we can actually, if we have some, the point B is just a fraction of LS node, which is the distance to the center of mass, 
and Q span is just a fraction of U2, and they both have the same ratio, we can actually achieve that this part is actually a constant, and we can then K3 will actually be proven in this case. So, uh, as a result, we actually try to test this in as on some uh, trajectory. And uh, we just gave some trajectory for the third zone. And this is what we actually got, testing both uh, uh, equations that they actually, they can, actually, they can uh, compensate completely in, in this case. But this is just testing on local, uh, on each joint on, uh, at, at once. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, so this uh, line represents the model torque. This line is considered the counter torque donated by the spring. And this is the result from torque along the, the whole trajectory and also for the same for the second one. So as a conclusion, we can actually find it like, we, it is actually possible to design some compact uh, compensator based only on the spring. The challenge with the prismatic joint is addressing the moving mass from the prismatic joint. Basically, adaptive system is, will be needed in this case so, so to, can, to be able to compensate for this moving mass. In the future, what we need to consider is like the dynamics of the system because now we included some springs and this is, will change completely the dynamics of the system. Also analysis of the energy and virtual work in this case because we ignored in this part the interactive forces between both of them and also the analysis of the stiffness properties to, uh, to understand what is a new stiffness in here and how can we use it. And this is all and thank you very much. Thank you. My question is, if I know, do you see any kind that always has the new thing for example, a linear source of force, which is constant, you need to transfer some new linear variable function, right? That has been done in my case, and that's how it works in my case, and this is how it works. Very specific shape uh, like here, not really here, but in three. You also like, use uh, like an artifact of everything to trace this shape. Ah, uh, camera. Yeah, camera. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, this has been like a standard tool for all those things. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be like just basically looking at this very complex and basic design presented that uh, it also tries to uh, provide a linear output. Basically, linear input, like the source of input is like a string, and you want a very specific linear output. So, why uh, not use? Um, I, I'm, I'm not criticizing, I understand that uh, like there could be various things, just interested in this. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so, the difference between using GAMS and this part, okay. Uh, first of all, from a practical point of view, using linear springs is much more cheaper than using a CAM. Generating, having a linear spring is much more cheaper from, uh, from computation, from manufacturing, from every point that to, to manufacture a CAM profile. That's first of all. Second of all, practically, CAMs were never used for uh, heavy load applications. They are usually for function generation, for uh, tracking positions, but they are not very efficient when it comes to uh, like heavy load. Here we are aiming to compensate for some load. And, and of course, this kind of application will be more practical in the case of uh, heavy robots, where uh, gravity forces are really significant. And camps in this case, yeah, they are very good when it comes to uh, function generation, and we you could just design whatever uh, a camp profile that can generate whatever function you want, and you can just do it. But from feasibility point of view, or even from uh, yeah, practice, practice point of view, this is not very efficient when it comes to uh, like yeah, applying that because of all the, the problems starting from how to follow the cam profile, well, like also the wearing effect and stuff like that. Also, maybe it would work, but like this is also I presented here from the theme or the bigger theme that we are trying to implement is to add more energy conserving elements inside. 
Uh, CAM is not energy conserving. It's just uh, to generate a, a function that you can just follow. And you will still need to add extra energy conserving. So here we are more concerned about torque and energy than just generating some output. Uh, because like generating some output, I mean, actuator is enough. I mean, and CAM will be more or less produce the same thing. So, uh, but like here also like prevented from this way because we are more interested into trying to redesign mechanical systems or, or robotic system to have more elements inside or built in built in elements that can conserve energy and and since we have for example in this case this is a modeled force we can easily or like we can try and we are still on design phase we can try to generate or create an element that can con actually conserve this energy inside so maybe it will work the camp solution maybe it will work uh, there are actually some papers we were like that we read that actually employ cam profile but they were not very popular. More is a crank slider mechanism, for example, is more used, pop, uh, like it's more popularly used uh, other than spring. But also, camp slider mechanism is also adds more energy because it adds more weight. So, like the whole advantage or like the best advantage of using just spring that the potential energy it adds to the system is nearly insignificant. But it it actually it's really good element for conserving energy in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, in this case, uh, what, what you can replace the mechanical mm -hmm. is a system of pulleys, belts, uh, transmission, uh -huh. and gears. The springs have to stay, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because you also grab it, you say you have to have springs, yes. Yes. some kind of thing. Yes. Uh, and come can replace all of the other elements. So in this case, uh, I agree with one else, but I think it would be good to have a Solution, and we are sure that there are other solutions for this. We are just more uh, concerned of the modeling of the problem yeah. itself. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. So this part is more of an engineering problem. I think like many engineers will be more interested into finding out replacement solutions. Uh, but yeah. We're... Yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. I mean, you you need to have some systems that you can model your problem on, but still. I mean, having using those specific elements or different elements, I think this is more of an engineering problem. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Now, let me uh, thank Salvador Pedri for this nice presentation.